Kamate, Dr. Florence Kamate, at the 21st Conference for Age Management Medicine in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I'm here with Dr. Michael Jawinski. That That's right. That yes, correctly? very Excellent. well. Excellent. Um, who gave a phenomenal lecture today on genes and epigenetic mechanisms at the interface of metabolism and biological age. Michael, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Please feel free to call me Florence. Um, Michael, uh, we have some questions about that topic that I think it would be great mm -hmm. to share with physicians who are interested in how to move forward in this brave new world of precision medicine. And so it would be great to start with how do you see that an individual's metabolism and genetics are connected? Well, of course, uh, genetics, the genes, are the code that uh, determines our basic architecture. But, you know, they, they're not uh, the be-all and end-all because our phenotype, or how we actually present, is dependent on the environment as well. It's the interaction between the genes and environment. So there's a basic equation in genetics. It's essentially genes plus environment equals phenotype. So you, when you talk about uh, genes and genetic effects, they can be a certain fraction of the total, responsible for a certain fraction of the total phenotype, and the environment is the rest. There's also another aspect, and uh, that is the uh, interaction term between the genes and the environment. So it's not only an additive, Thing, but it's also a multiplicative thing. But that, that part is difficult to access, at least it has been thus far in human genetics. It's very easy to uh, work on uh, in model organisms. Part of my uh, work has always been with yeast. And there we can study genetic interactions at will. In fact, there are some famous human geneticists who uh, got frustrated with their inability to study that term in human populations, and so they're actually working on yeast to understand it better so that that'll inform their work in humans. So there really are three, but the ones that we generally talk about are genes and environment because they're the easiest to access. Interesting. I actually, in my career, before I went to med school, I was doing work in genetics in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay, and that's then that's we have the something model. in common exactly. there. Exactly, yes. and actually won an award in undergrad that a SOC award for that work that uh -huh. got me um, a scholarship to medical school. Wow, I okay, was very fortunate. that's fantastic. Yeah, I think another definition that would be wonderful to better have a better understanding of is epigenetics, and we've actually touched on it because you've mentioned. Mm -hmm that genes alone are not enough. It's the interaction with the environment. And epigenetics is part of that right. whole interaction as we all are beginning to understand that. Just being programmed in terms of what our blueprint sure. looks like in our DNA and our genes is not necessarily our destiny. So even though we have a genetic makeup that is built of many building blocks, it doesn't necessarily have to lead in any specific mm -hmm. direction. So it'd be fun to have you explain what is epigenetics and what does that mean to healthy longevity? Right, so epigenetics has had uh, various definitions uh, over the uh, decades, but what we understand it to be now uh, when we talk about epigenetics is uh, changes that are heritable but do not involve changes in the actual structure of the DNA, the base sequence, the genetic code, A, G, C, T. I think everybody uh, is equated with those four letters now. So we use four letter words in genetics. Right. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah. I never thought anyway, of it that way. And those yeah. four letters make those up four letters, billions but, but, of uh, messages. But they, they carry all this basic information. But then the way that information is actually expressed uh, depends on how these genes are regulated. And that's where the epigenetics comes in, because it involves uh, uh, certain reactions uh, that uh, uh, modify not the sequence of A, G, C, and T, but modify the Cs. There are methyl groups that are added to those Cs. That's an epigenetic change. Um, the Cs alone of the A, it's mainly, G, C, It's mainly the Cs. There, are, mm -hmm. there is some methylation of As as well, but it's mainly the Cs in, in, um, in uh, Cg uh, pairs. So you have Cg pairs and the C 
is methylated. So that's one kind of uh, epigenetic uh, uh, change. And by making that change, just to clarify, you might get a differential expression of that gene. Correct. You may, so these changes, some of them uh, are pretty silent because they're in regions that uh, do not really affect gene expression, but there are those that have real effects on gene expression. Uh, they can be in islands where there are many of them in tandem, uh, close to uh, regions of uh, the genome that are called promoters, where uh, you have transcription factors that bind to the DNA and activate the transcription of the gene, actually read the information that's in the DNA. Uh, there can also be methylations in, in those actual sites where the transcription factors bind and altering their binding. But methylation is only one of those changes. Uh, as uh, we heard in one of the other talks um, in, in, this morning, uh, DNA is wrapped around proteins to form, form chromatin. These are histones. They're present in uh, these octomers. And these histones have these tails that can be modified. They're sticking out there. And they can be acetylated. They can be methylated, phosphorylated, ubiquitylated. There are many different modifications. And depending on these modifications, where they are and in which histone, the chromatin becomes more open and therefore allowing these transcription factors to come in and bind and activate the gene, or it can be more closed, preventing the access to the gene by the transcription factor. So these are yet other changes. There are several other uh, epigenetic changes that occur as well, but the key factor here is that these changes, like you said, affect the expression of the gene, and they're not something that is necessarily passed down from our parents. It's something that is acquired, although in terms of the methylation pattern uh, from one uh, cell to cells that are derived by cell division, it can be maintained. So there is some heritability uh, from one generation of cells to the other, but not necessarily from parents to children. Exactly, and to bring it to full form, it could mean that there's a gene that might act out because of the change and the epigenetic sure, change sure, and, sure. and can cause a, a disease to show up. And in other forms, it could shut something down so you might right. not express a gene. Exactly, and, and uh, the environment as well as lifestyle, I mentioned in my talk, physical activity can change epigenetic patterns in the chromatin. Actually, it's a great segue to the, the next question. When you discussed personalized exercise regimen, what do you mean? And how could we actually have physicians begin to incorporate that in their personal practice and guide patients in that direction? So we're, of course, we're very early in this, in this area. So uh, you have to understand that some of this is speculative. But from the work that we've done, uh, the work I talked about uh, in terms of differences between male and female in uh, their, uh, the contributing factors to the increase in metabolic rate, resting metabolic rate, with uh, unhealthy aging, uh, one would postulate that uh, in females the issue is muscle mass and in males it's muscle quality. Now, having said that, you also remember <clears throat> that there are genetic variants that affect how that plays itself out. So in uh, uh, females, I showed that uh, this uh, variant in the uncoupling protein 3 gene, in that, if, that, if the uh, female has that variant, there's no increase in the resting metabolic rate, while in the presence of the other variant, there's a a big increase. So that's where we come in with the precision medicine part of it. So yes, one would say we should approach male and female somewhat differently in general in terms of how we devise exercise regimens. But we have to go even further. We have to understand some of the underlying genetic variation. And uh, it's modulated, this effect is modulated by that, that gene, UCP3. So we, we need to take that into account. And there are likely to be many others like that uh, that we're not acquainted with yet that we should become acquainted with and would make it more possible to more precisely devise the correct strategy with the patient. 
For each individual. For so each individual. Instead of a one size fits all, we're getting right. an, an of one approach. Do you see this as a reality in the clinic itself and for physicians to right. actually begin to implement within the next year, two, five, ten? So let me just say this, that when, when we're doing research and we're trying to accumulate data and we're trying to uh, understand m mechanisms underlying uh, these uh, physiologic responses, we have to study many individuals. One individual uh, who responds a certain way does not make the case for us. Once we have that information, then we can start thinking about tailoring these responses to the individual based on the properties we learned about in the research. And that's the stage that we're at right now. Uh, so yes, you're going, physicians don't see thousands of patients in their office at once. They're dealing with the individual. So of course it has to be an individualized approach. Uh, and I think that you know, we are now on a, beginning to get on a rising trajectory of beginning to be able to uh, apply some of the things that uh, genetics has uh, revealed in terms of its application to individual patients. Personalized medicine or uh, precision medicine as it's or as I sometimes compromise, since I strongly believe that all medicine is personal, personalized yes. precision medicine. So we yeah, can use the too. right data to apply yes. to individuals yes. and approach them each as unique as each right. of us are. Keeping in mind one thing, though, that, uh, again, because there are so many factors involved, we can only talk in terms of probabilities. So you'll never be able to say, 100% certainty that a certain person will respond a certain way. You can get close, but you'll never get to 100%. And the reason is what you, we were just talking about. It's not only the genetic variation, it's the environment as it plays itself out through the epigenome. And that's a brilliant comment. The way we've dealt with it over two decades is by monitoring people directly longitudinally so we can see cause and effect and make changes over time. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. This well, thank is an you. It's been a pleasure. Same here. We enjoy having you and look forward to many more lectures of the same in the future. Thank you. Thank you.